When we move into post-Cold War conflicts, a really important question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is war? It sounds like it's a pretty basic question, but I want you to think about what you think of when you hear the word war. What comes to mind? What are the visuals? A lot of times for us, the visuals that come to mind are people um, fighting in combat with guns or with swords or something like that, hand to hand, where your enemy is visible to you. Um, both of you are, are using physical force um, against each other. And this is a question that has actually come into discussion recently in the United States. Um, what is war? Is the type of warfare that we're fighting in the Middle East, is that technically warfare? The dynamics of war are really changing. It used to be dishonorable to be a sniper um, because you're, you're basically hiding out and sniping people. Um, it's also considered dishonorable today to um, you know, use women and children and other civilians as, as human bombs and yet people use them. Um, and, and the United States glorifies its snipers. We have a, we have a book and a movie out called American Sniper. Um, so, so warfare in and of itself is changing. Um, today we have people that are fighting wars from beaches um, while sipping culottes and, um, and using their computers to drop drones and other things. So warfare is really different today, and, and it's an important question to keep in mind what makes war just, um, how how should, should we be fighting these wars um, in the Middle East? And with the end of the Cold War, our focus really shifts to, um, to the Middle East um, because now our interests, our economic interests related to oil and energy um, are, require us to focus on the Middle East. So today I want to talk about the end of the Cold War and the Middle East. At the end of the Cold War, throughout the late 70s and 80s, we're in a period of arms reduction, arms being weapons, trying to reduce the amount of weapons that exist. Fear and competition between the United States and the USSR during the Cold War was intense. Um, fear on both sides was extreme. It was in the interest of both to slow and limit the number of nuclear missiles created during the arms race of the Cold War. During the Cold War, more than 128,000 nuclear warheads were produced, enough to blow up the world many times over. One of the first um, arms reduction talks happens under President Ford's administration. This is Ford pictured here um, on the left, and it's called SALT in 1977. SALT stands for Strategic Arms, uh, it's, it, well, it's the second Strategic Arms Limitation Talks. Um, this treaty was to cut back the weaponry of the U.S. and the USSR. It set limits on the number of weapons that could be produced. Unfortunately, it was not passed by the Senate as retaliation for the fact that the USSR invaded Afghanistan. They invaded Afghanistan because it was, a com it was establishing a communist country there and they wanted to help um, maintain communism in Afghanistan. Because that talk didn't go very well and um, tensions were still pretty high with the USSR, despite the fact that the USSR's economy was actually struggling throughout the 1980s, people um, in the USSR and in East Berlin um, are, are starving and not doing very well. Um, we we um, are, are still really concerned about the amount of nuclear weapons that they have. Turns out later that a lot of their nuclear capability, not their capabilities, but the amount of weapons they had was faked. Um, some of their missiles were made out of wood and other things to, to make it appear as if they had more, but they didn't. Um, but we didn't know that at the time. And so we created SDI, also known as Star Wars, in 1983 under President Reagan's administration. SDI stands for Strategic Defense Initiative. Um, it was created under Reagan. It was also known as Star Wars. And what the idea here was to have satellites that could shoot down ballistic missiles. A lot of the ideas in SDI were a bit far-fetched. Um, and in one uh, 
history piece on this was that it was created. It didn't do very much. It's something that we put in our history textbooks, but it's not really something that, that accomplished very much. Um, eventually, this was abandoned just because it was expensive, far-fetched, and um, the realization that the USSR wasn't doing very well. Um, another treaty, um, the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty, was signed in 1987 under Reagan again. Reagan's pictured on the right here. Um, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces was an agreement signed in 1987 by Reagan and Gorbachev um, that provided for the destruction of about 2,500 Soviet and American missiles in Europe. So basically taking down the number of arms that we have, reducing the amount of arms that are available to both countries. START is another example of arms reduction, strategic arms reduction treaties. There were actually two different treaties that were signed, um, this one by President Bush Sr. Um, there might possibly be a third one coming up here. What START was was treaties to reduce the number of nuclear missile, missiles each side had total, not just in Europe. When the USSR collapsed, four independent countries emerged. So START II was created um, and eliminated the, the missiles that were held in Kazakhstan, um, Ukraine, and other um, Soviet satellite countries that, that broke off from the USSR, um, that seceded from the USSR when it collapsed. Um, the START Two treaty um, basically established that only Russia would have weapons, and so the weapons that were in Kazakhstan and the Ukraine were pulled out. The Cold War ends um, in 1989. The Berlin Wall comes down in Germany. In 1990, Germany's east and west is reunified, and so it wasn't until 1990 that Germany was actually back as a country again. Um, in 1991, the USSR collapses economically and many states succeed. The map here shows um, the states that succeed from the USSR after the collapse. Um, you can see Estonia, Lithuania, um, Latvia, Ukraine, um, Poland, uh, Kazakhstan and, and some other Middle Eastern countries there. Um, and then number 11 on the map there is, is what's today known as the Russian Federation. And, and again, the USSR had faked some of its nuclear ability during the Cold War, which we found out later. There's a really interesting clip posted on my website um, that you should consider watching. This is um, Ronald Reagan's Tear Down This Wall speech. Um, this is a famous speech that he gave prior to the Berlin Wall coming down, um, basically challenging Gorbachev and saying, you know, if you really want peace, if you really want um, improved relations with the United States, then take down this wall. This is a symbol of our separation. It's a symbol of communist totalitarian oppression. Um, take it down, open up trade with us, and, and create peace. The Gulf War is um, a war that quickly follows the Cold War. It's a war that takes place between us and Iraq, and the United States comes in um, possibly to liberate Kuwait, but also to protect our interests in oil. Um, in 1990, Iraq invaded its oil-rich neighbor, Kuwait. Um, remember that after World War I, the Allied forces had divvied up the Middle Eastern countries to protect our oil interests. The United States um, came in basically because Kuwait is one of the most dense um, countries in terms of, of oil and, and having oil resources. And Iraq wanted Kuwait for oil purposes and, and we wanted to protect Kuwait's um, interests because we also wanted their oil. Iraq claimed that Kuwait was a historical part of Iraq and depending on how far back you go, that is definitely true. Um, Kuwait used to be part of Iraq if you consider like the Mesopotamia, Fertile Crescent, um, pre-World War I. Um, and, and so yes, um, Kuwait has been and the borders were drawn arbitrarily by imperial um, Western forces after World War I, so that is possibly true. They also felt like 
Kuwait was artificially keeping oil prices low, and it was really hard for Iraq to compete with Kuwait's prices. Um, and, and so these two, and, you know, we had divvied up these countries to create that competition to force these countries to keep the prices low. And Iraq felt like they could not compete with Kuwait. And so they invaded Kuwait um, because they, they couldn't compete with them. The United States had allies in the region, namely Israel and Saudi Arabia, and then also Kuwait. And so we felt obligated to come in and protect them. President Bush Sr. Um, in 1990 organizes countries to stop arms and oil sales to, the, um, to Iraq. He basically creates a coalition of um, countries, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, some of the Western countries, um, to not trade with Iraq, put sanctions on them to try to encourage them to pull out of Kuwait. Um, it is debated historically whether or not these sanctions were working. Some historians feel like we needed to add a little bit of force to put emphasis on the sanctions. Others are convinced that the sanctions were working and that the United States did not need to um, use force to emphasize these um, sanctions. So it's kind of an interesting um, historical piece to debate. Um, Bush felt like Iraq's control over Kuwait disrupted the balance of power. And by disrupted the balance of power, um, we mean two things. Um, one, Iraq now has access to more oil fields, more control of the oil industry. And so um, we felt, uh, Bush felt strongly that this disrupted the balance of power. It, it decreased competition in the region to keep oil prices low. Um, it also, he also felt like this gave Saddam Hussein too much more, too much control. And so Saddam Hussein being the dictator of Iraq. And so, um, we, we really felt like um, pushing the Iraqis out of Kuwait was an important um, diplomat or, uh, um, foreign affairs concern. The operation um, was, was pretty short and sweet. It's called Operation Desert Storm. Bush doubled the, the number of soldiers in the Persian Gulf stationed. Um, Persian Gulf is the gulf that um, you can see actually back in this picture, um, uh, just touching Kuwait there. Um, doubled the number of soldiers in the P Persian Gulf and stationed in Saudi Arabia. Um, Bush used both air strikes and ground offensive. Our air missions were, we had overwhelming superiority over the Iraqis, um, and we were able to push the Iraqi military back out of Kuwait. Um, we had tremendous artillery, and we were able to, um, you know, use the, the artillery to, to destroy cities as we came into them. Um, this was a, a major Amer um, American and, and coalition um, victory for the United States. Bush left Iraq's dictator, Saddam Hussein, in power. We pushed within miles of Baghdad and actually left him in control, which is an interesting um, choice. Both, Clint, uh, both Bush and Clinton, who follows Bush, um, have had opportunities to take out Saddam Hussein and didn't. And so part of our invasion of Iraq in 2003 was to finish the job and take out Saddam Hussein. He was a pretty awful dictator who was committing genocide against Kurds, in, um, which is an ethnic group in his country, um, and, and did a lot of awful things to minority groups, um, held public executions, still did stonings. Of, of women and other people in, this, in the country. Um, death penalty was often used. So he was an awful dictator. And if we had been fighting this war for humanitarian reasons, we probably would have continued into Baghdad to stop him. Um, he was portrayed as this awful person um, in the American media at the time, but yet we left him in power. And one of the reasons we left him in power was to keep him as a balance against Iran. Iraq and Iran have traditionally been enemies, and so we liked having him sort of there to, um, to use him if Iran ever got out of control. And so we actually left him alive and in power. Um, an environmental issue in the um, aftermath of this war, I, as Iraq was retreating, they set fire to Kuwait's oil fields, and so there's um, f um, a lot of smoke and ash and other issues that um, polluted the region. 
Um, many of the soldiers returning from Iraq um, and, and Kuwait suffered from Gulf War Syndrome, a form of PTSD, which was used to describe illnesses that they were faced with. Um, Overall, 3,500 civilians died in bombings, 100,000 from other incidents, which it's unclear what that really means. Um, 35,000 Iraqi combatants died. Um, less than 1,000 coalition combatants died, which is a pretty big victory for the coalition. Um, most of the coalition forces were American. Um, I think there was about um, 300 American deaths, 24% of those were from friendly fire, um, which is a pretty um, staggering statistic um, that most of the American deaths were from friendly fire. Um, there are interesting articles on the Gulf War, and I suggest you check them out, but an important question to ask yourself is, is the Gulf War an example of U.S. aggression, or are we a liberator freeing Kuwait from the occupation by Iraq?